My castaway this week is Brian Cox. He's one of the UK's most successful and experienced actors. He recently celebrated his 60th year in the business by collecting a Golden Globe for his tour de force performance as billionaire patriarch Logan Roy in HBO's acclaimed series Succession. Lauded equally for his performances on stage and screen, he won an Olivier for his Titus Andronicus, played King Lear at the National and has over 100 film roles to his name, including The Born Identity, Braveheart and Manhunter in which he played the first on-screen incarnation of Hannibal Lecter. Perhaps fittingly, his appetite for both film and theatre started at home in Dundee, where he grew up going to his local picture house four times a week and working in the local rep when he was still a teenager, though in those days he had to clean the stage rather than perform on it. He says, I've done it my own way. You can't sit back and say, I've arrived. The only way you arrive is when you're dead. Brian Cox, welcome to Desert Island Discs. Did I really say that? You did, apparently so. <laughs> welcome. Well, thank so, you. Brian, as I say, you're a very, very flexible actor. You've played villains and heroes aplenty, including Churchill and Sir Matt Busby. Do you have a favourite type of character? Are villains more fun to play in general? Well, they always say the devil has the best tunes. And uh, so, yeah. I mean, I, at one point in my life, this was about 25 years ago, I, I suddenly thought, why am I playing all these nasty people? And I kind of worried for a bit, but it, it didn't last for more than 10 minutes. <laughs> You've recently been playing the villainous media mogul Logan Roy then in HBO's hit succession and so well that, as I say, you were awarded a Golden Globe in January this year. Is he based on anyone in particular? Not really. I mean, everybody thinks he's about um, Conrad Black or uh, Rupert Murdoch or, you know, they, they, all, they all have theories about who it is. I, I think Logan and I both have one thing in common. We find the human experiment rather disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a misanthropy that you share. Oh, yeah. I flirt with misanthropy all the time, but uh, I'm an optimist, so I always come down on the, the good side. I did read that when you were out in public, a lot of people, including uh, fellow actors, now want you to repeat some of Logan's more Absolute, choice lines. Absolutely, yeah. What's been the most peculiar request that you've had? Well, it was at a Me Too meeting with Ronan Farrow, and... Uh, it was very serious. I was invited by the actress um, Rosanna Arquette. She was actually having this launch, book launch. So I went along. And then as it ended, I suddenly found myself surrounded by a lot of ladies. Not all of them. I mean, I don't want to exaggerate. But one, maybe two, did ask me the inevitable. Could they video me telling them to F off? <laughs> <laughs> and I what went, did you say? And I said... Is that really appropriate at a Me Too meeting? But I think that's also to do with the kind of confusion that we live in at the moment, you know. And it's also what the series is about. It's about people, they kind of love this this sort of naked ambition of somebody like uh, Logan, but at the same time they go, oh, you know, we, we, lo we love to hate him, but actually they love to love him as well. It's a kind of complex. It's Brian Cooks. I wondered about research, especially when it comes to playing real life people. You very memorably played Churchill in 2017. How do you prepare for a role like that? Well, with Churchill, you know, you have to use your investigating skills. You have to find out what the man was. I mean, Churchill was an interesting character because he was a construct, you know, the hat, the cigar, the V sign, just his whole meal was created. And it was created for an effect and it had a tremendous effect because he was, you know, he had been a troubled character. Uh, he had made a lot of mistakes in his career, but this was his moment. This was his hour of glory and, they, and it was the Second World War. And what about the idea of playing someone who has been portrayed on screen and is, as you say, you know, an icon in their own right? That idea of finding a real person well, beneath that carapace. It, Alex von Tunselman, who wrote the script, it was a great premise. The premise was, and it's there is evidence, that he really didn't want D-Day to happen. And the reason was that Gallipoli, which he was responsible for, had been such a mess. So these beach invasions were something he was highly nervous of. And the loss of life, uh, he was very nervous about it. And also he'd been ill just in the previous winter. So he was in a very fragile state. He wasn't the Winston Churchill we all know. Uh, I mean, he still had the front and everything, and he was bold as um, brass, and, and, and he's dealing with everybody. But he was in a minority because everybody wanted it to go, and he was really on the shelf about it. So that's wonderful material to work on, a man in doubt. 
you know, especially a great man and don't, you know. And that's what I really admire about Churchill, who can be a, he could be a right pain at some times, but he, in his moment of glory, he was, he, everything came together. You so, know. what are your earliest memories of acting? You grew up going to the pictures a lot, but do you remember acting yourself? Yeah, well, um, my dad died when I was eight, and my mom had a series of very severe nervous breakdowns. So she had electric shock treatment, so mm -hmm. she was institutionalized for quite a lot of my childhood. Mm -hmm. But until that happened, until I was eight, life was blissful, really very happy. But the thing that my dad used to do was on New Year, we had a, a window recess and there was a bunker where we kept the coal and there was curtains. So that, and my sister, May, who was a very flamboyant singer, wonderful singer, my sister, and she used to say, presenting Brian Cox. And <laughs> she'd swing open the curtains and I would do Jolson impersonations. Oh. And I would do Jolson with the actions and everything. And of course, the thing was, one o'clock in the morning on New Year's Day, there would be a lot of drunken people in the room, but they were so giving. And I just thought, wow, this is good. You remember the applause. I remembered it, mm -hmm. you know, from, and I was about two and a half, three. <laughs> you were born in Dundee and you were the much younger brother of five siblings. And your parents worked locally in the, in the local mills? My dad worked in the mill initially, but he was the youngest of 13. I mean, and his sister was like 25 years older than him. So she actually had a pension and she put him in a shop, his little grocery shop in a place called Charles Street. He then started to run the shop and he was very good at figures. He was very good at stuff. But the problem of my dad, and it was what came to roost after the war, was he was, and my mother always used to say, just remember, Brian, charity begins at home. And he was very generous. And that's always the problem I've had about being a dad, because mm. my dad was mythic. Mm. And so when you come to the reality of having four kids of your own, you cannot be a mythic father. So you go, what do I do? <laughs> and how do you remember him? What, do you, what was he like? He was just sweet. He was kind. He was warm. He had a lovely chuckle. It was this, he was the center of the community. But unfortunately, at the same time, he did give, you know, people were poor. Mm. And he gave people a lot of credit. And he died within three weeks of his diagnosis. So he had pancreatic cancer. So he mm. died within three weeks. We were left with debts. We were left, and my mum had a breakdown. And it was, it just all went belly up. It was horrific. You were just eight when that happened. Mm. I mean, it must have been an extraordinarily difficult time. Yeah. And you were so young. I just went into survival mode, you know, and that's what sustained me throughout my life. I'm with this present crisis. I'm currently in survival mode. And what's that like? Really, you keep in touch with yourself. You keep in touch with your inner person. Mm -hmm. And you keep in touch with that wee boy. When I teach, because I teach drama and stuff, and I always say to my students, always carry a picture of yourself as a child, because that's who you are. And never forget it. Mm -hmm. That wee person is who you are. That person of wonder, that person of amazement, that person of joy is who you are. And the rest is just propaganda that you've had to deal with. And what's your picture of yourself, if you were going to hold that up to well, us? Well, I have a picture of me just sitting there on a little high stool, holding this ball, and I have this just gorgeous smile. And I look at it and I go, wow. And it's, it's a fantastic reminder, and it keeps you straight. Mm -hmm. Brian Cox, as you were saying, your mum, Molly, she was left a young widow of five children. Money, obviously very tight. How did the family keep going through the period that followed well, your Well, my sisters were married. They had their own husbands and families and, uh, you know, modest. I mean, my sister Betty, she lived in two rooms on a, a landing with five families and toilets on the stair mm. you know, that they shared, two toilets. Mm -hmm. And I would stay with them on occasion. And I, would, I mean, there was literally two rooms. They, Betty and Dave, my brother-in-law, they slept in the front room. And my nephews, uh, David and Kevin, they slept. And I would occasionally sleep there with them. Mm. You, know, it was, you know, it was the way it was. And people had to be stoical. I mean, people don't quite realize that about, for instance, my sister Betty, that there was a lot going on for people. It was tough. It was really tough. And uh, you had to have a certain stoicism to deal with it all. Yeah. 
having moved on in your life and stepping outside of that culture sometimes gives you a different perspective on it though I wonder what you make of that of looking back at those hard times and your attitude to money and for example must have been influenced by, yeah, by what you experienced I mean, as a kid I mean, I've always had issues about my money because we didn't have any when my mum came out of the hospital finally and she got a small job but she mainly lived off the widow's pension so and her pension would come on a Friday and sometimes on a Thursday night not always, but sometimes we wouldn't have any food. And uh, I would go across to the local fish and chip shop and we would get batter bits from the back of the pan and that would be our tea for a, for a Thursday night. And uh, it's kind of, it sounds cliche, but it's true. But it instills in you a sense of value of stuff, mm -hmm. you know. I'm a bit cautious. I can be a bit um, parsimonious at times. <laughs> I did the Bill Maher show last week in the States, and uh, and he kept saying, why are you a socialist? Why are you a socialist? And I said, you Americans, you don't know the first thing about socialism. You have no idea. You conflate it with reds under the beds. And I'll tell you why I'm a socialist. Poverty. Poverty is what makes you a socialist. When you know poverty, then you know about them how we have to take care of our people. And I mean, what about in your own personal experiences, aside from politics? I know that you can be a bit of a hoarder, apparently. I am, yeah. I have a thing about clothes. Mm -hmm. I have a bigger wardrobe than my wife, <laughs> I am ashamed to say. But I love clothes. I don't wear them all the time, but I just do, you know. I think it's one of those things that you're left with, you know, it's a kind of insecurity that makes you do that you know there's a it has to come out somewhere and it comes out in the most extraordinary ways there's lots of help around these days for bereaved children yeah. was anyone able to help you not really your family? No. i just had to deal with it you know mm -hmm. i didn't go to my father's funeral which i kind of sort of regret and they put me in front of a television i remember when my dad died i remember coming home and uh and I realized there was something wrong. And then I walked and the door was open and I could see. It's very funny when the, we have kind of great things like tragedies or even births or whatever. There's always lots of food. So the, the table was covered in food. And I could just see my mum over the top of the table, you know, just in abject, you know, misery, you know, mm -hmm. because of what had happened. It's time for your fourth disc, Brian. What are we going to hear and why? Well, in my generation, I came to London in the 60s. And of course, it was the time of incredible social mobility. And it was the time of the Beatles. I once went to a party in Dundee, and they had been playing. So I came to this party, which was in Baxter Park. There was all these journalists from DC Thompson's, and they were all very excited. I said, who are these the two guys lying fast asleep and one was uh, George Harrison the other was Ringo Starr <laughs> so I never because they were they were clearly exhausted the poor guys I never met them but that was that's all I saw them and they said that they're asleep next door like that and that was the great thing about the 60s was social mobility I could get a grant, you know, this is what really annoys me now, I was a working class kid I could get a grant, I could go to London, I could study my craft, my desire. I had all my expenses paid as well. But at the same time, was this amazing music. And uh, these guys from Liverpool and all rock and rollers. And what I've chosen is... because. So, Brian Cox, your first encounter with the theatre then, I think that was at Dundee Rep. How did you end up working there? I had these two great teachers, a guy called George Hackett and a guy called Bill Dewar. And my, my education was a complete disaster. I mean, it really was. You know, I was designed for to be a technical kid. I mean, I couldn't make any of those wooden boats. I mean, they looked like nothing on earth. So I was just completely hopeless. So it wasn't a school that I really had much hope for. But I had these two guys who could clearly saw something in me and were very supportive of me. And one was an art teacher and the other one was an English teacher. But Bill Dewar introduced me to the rep club and it was on four o'clock on a Wednesday they used to a bunch of kids would go to the rep and it was my first experience of live theater and I was well I was 14 and I'd just seen Albert Finney at the same time so I knew what I wanted to do mm -hmm. and I was very excited and what happened was that um, Bill said look I've got this ex-student of mine he's going to go to drama school and I said what's that he said well it's a school for acting and he's going to Glasgow he said but his job is coming up at the rep he said, maybe you should apply for it. So 
I got an interview and uh, I went to the office and they were asking me about classical music because I knew nothing. I mean, but we had a wonderful music teacher called Brad Cato and he'd been playing the trumpet march from Aida. So I kind of just said, well, you know, I really do like Verdi. I think Aida is one of my favorites, particularly the trumpet march. <laughs> and he was, <laughs> he, I mean, he kind of knew that I was blagging it. So I got the job and I started and I used to take the money to the bank in the morning. I would run errands. I was a sort of general factor. I'd run errands for the secretary. And then in the evening, I had the task of mopping the stage. Mm. So that was what I had to do. I wasn't allowed backstage I, unless uh, there was some uh, scene shifting. And then I would go back and do some scene shifting. But then when I got backstage, I eventually graduated to become probably the worst stage manager there ever been. The uh, worst? The worst. I was why, terrible. Why so bad? Well, I was constantly doing things like um, <laughs> I would be, <laughs> you know, I'd be, I'd be on the book, you know, and I'd be in the prompt corner and I'd be doing a play called, I think it was Rollo, and the actors are sort of doing their stuff and suddenly there's a pause and I don't know, and I can't see them. And I'm on page 20 and they're probably on page 40 now and I'm going, and I'm looking, and there's a tap on my shoulder and I turn and the actress says to me, telephone. I said, for me? She said, no, on stage. <laughs> you were supposed to make the phone ring. I was ring. supposed to ring the phone. <laughs> I was hopeless. I'm surprised they didn't fire me, but they didn't. Brian Cox, your early career was spent in repertory theatre, and I read that by the age of 22, you'd played Bolingbroke, Orlando, Peer Gint, Mercutio, and Iago. And that seems a staggering achievement you know, for one at such a young age. You know, it was the time. We had these repertory theatres, which were phenomenal, and I was at Birmingham Rep. I started at the Lyceum after I left Thomas School in Edinburgh, and then after a year I went to Birmingham to work with this extraordinary Yorkshireman called Peter Dews. Are you all right, lovey? What do you want to play? He asked me what I wanted to play, and I told him, and I ended up playing virtually 80% of what I, <laughs> what I said. And that was the time of when we did fortnightly reps, three-weekly rep. Uh, we were in repertoire, so we were the first repertoire uh, system. We did two Shakespeare's together, then we would do uh, separate things like Peer Gint in the winter. And it was an amazing time, and I went to the West End. That was my first journey to the West End uh, when I was 21. I mean, I was terrible in all of the roles, it has to be said, but it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Young actors don't get that experience now. It's just a shame. So there's it's a lot of experience available and, and opportunity, but it's also, you must have had a tremendous appetite for the work. You know, well, you're obviously yeah, putting yourself I mean, forward for things. You know, it was a surfeit, you know, of stuff that I just went for. And I was ambitious, quite ambitious when I was young, but I was ambitious for the work. You know, it was about the work. I just wanted to get better and improve, and hopefully I did. <laughs> Some of those performances have gone down in theatrical history. I mean, Titus Andronicus with the RSC especially. Mm. How did it feel to, to get that particular triumph under your belt? Well, it was odd because I started life when I was a kid. It was movies. I really wanted to be a movie actor. The generation of Albert and Peter and Tom, they did movies. But it became kind of a different class of people doing movies in the 70s and 80s. It wasn't happening for me. But I did television. And television, of course, in this country was fantastic. And I had a great time. But I, I did two plays that brought me to America. I, they, they were very successful. And out of that, I got this film, Manhunter. And so that was the beginning of... I mean, I'd done a couple of films early on, right at the start. I played Trotsky and Nicholas and Alexander, but this was the start of something. So I was focusing on that. But then my marriage fell apart. So I realized I'd have to go home. I had to go back to London and be present for my kids. So I joined the RSC, and it was the best move I ever made. You moved to America in the 90s, and you described once breaking into Hollywood as being like wrestling with a blancmange. Yes. <laughs> Why? Because it is. I mean, you realize, you know, they're always very sweet, very nice, and, and fickle as anything. <laughs> you know, you can't really take any of it seriously. 
and you shouldn't. I remember I, I went to Hollywood in the 70s. The life then, the fastness of the life, the glibness of the life, is something that I really couldn't take, I really couldn't handle it, and um, I didn't succumb. I just came back, did my work. You know. As my old friend Fulton Mackay used to say, follow your mercenary calling and draw your wages. <laughs> <laughs> you settled in New York, but I know that you've said about your home country, Scotland, that uh, it draws you back, particularly oh, yeah. as you get older. Do you miss it? Yeah, I do. I'm there a lot, actually. My sister has now gone into a care home in near Aberfeldy, so hopefully she's going to be fine. You know, she's got her 90th is coming up any day. Unfortunately, I won't be able to get back for it because of the restrictions. But uh, it's God's country. It's just beautiful. There's nowhere like it. Nowhere like it. You know, it's just incredible. Fortunately, I do have to cast you away. Oh, you Brian. do? I could talk to you all day, but, but you've got to go to your island. Mm-hmm. How will you manage? Do you have any practical skills that might come in useful? I can be quite practical if I'm forced to be. I'm not by nature, but if I'm forced to be, I can be. I, resourceful. I, yeah, I can be resourceful, you know. So I'm I'm not too bad, especially now. The present crisis is probably the safest place to be, you know. <laughs> and how are you with solitude? How are you on your own? Oh, I love being on my own. I absolutely love it. I mean, I love my wife, I love my family, but I have a, a little man cave here in London, which my wife has been allowed to live in for the last, to do the play. <laughs> but it is my man cave, and I I do value my solitude. So, Brian Cox, it's time to cast you away to your desert island. I will, of course, give you the books to keep you company there. You will have the Bible and the complete works of Shakespeare. Yeah, I don't particularly want the Bible. Well, I'll give you both. Uh, you can also take another book of your choice. What would you like? I would like a book. Uh, it's by Pieter Spensky. It's called In Search of the Miraculous. It's about man's quest for consciousness and um, being conscious. It's yours. You can also have a luxury item. What would you like there? I think, depending on the state of my clothes, I would like a very, very good sewing kit. Ah, okay. Yeah. We can give you a full box, you know, one yeah. with the little layers yeah. that pull out. I, I, and then, I wouldn't yeah. mind that. Telescopic. Because I like sewing. Yeah, fantastic. Are you, are you good at it? I'm not bad. I had to learn to do it when I was very young, so mm. it's something I do. I mean, I'm just imagining that I might have some clothes that I need to repair. Absolutely. <laughs> well, it's all yours. And finally, if you had to save just one disc of the eight that we've heard today from the waves, which would it be? Oh, it's so hard. It's a toss-up, actually, and I can't decide. Um, it's either God Only Knows by the Beach Boys or it is Both Sides Now by Johnny Mitchell, so I can't decide. But I think, because of my wife, I think it has to be God Only Knows. I think that's the right choice. Brian Cox, thank you very much for letting us thank hear your you. Desert Islanders. Uh, thank you so much. It's been so enjoyable, I can't tell you.